and tonight I'm in the picture postcard region of Toscana! The beautiful region of Toscana shares its borders with Liguria, Emilia-Romagna, Umbria and Lazio. It's home to beautiful cities like Florence and Siena, which sit within its iconic yet familiar landscape, characterized by those distinctive cypress trees. This region's food heritage is firmly rooted in the land, with traditional game hunting of wild boar and deer. It's also the birthplace of many wines we know, most famously Chianti. In fact, Tuscany is so loved by the Brits, it's nicknamed Chantyshire. So I'm going deep into the Tuscan countryside to the province of Gaiole to taste for myself what makes around 400,000 of you come back here every year. Trust me, you may think you know Tuscany, but stick with me as I'm going to share some secret about this place. And where better to start than right here? The Barone Ricasoli vineyard is the oldest winery in Italy, established in 1141. It was right here in 1872 that the iconic Chianti Classico wine was created. They were so successful in honing their recipe, it's now the biggest vineyard producing Chianti Classico and I'm privileged enough to secure an invitation to see how this tipple is produced. And as Massimiliano, director of the vineyard, explained to me, the way they make the wine is true to tradition. You produce the world's most famous wine, the Chianti Classico. How do you feel? I'm very proud. Proud? Look, look you should be. Let me tell you something, when I was a little boy, mm -hmm. uh, probably seven, eight years old, I still remember my grandfather gave me a little uh, piece of bread with a little bit of wine on top and sugar, and that was my dessert. We still do this. You still do it yeah, with, with, with you? With my son. So tell me the history of Chianti Classico. It started uh, in the second half of 1800, okay. when uh, Bettino di Casoli, there was one of the baron, he wanted to produce one of the best wine ever. And they started to make experimentation about uh, what to grow and how to make the fermentation. And then then... The... So he played around with grapes, yes. I guess. So you're saying that to make a Chianti is a blend of grapes? Yes. The most important grapes is the Sangiovese. Sangiovese, first Minimum grape. 80%. Okay. And we can add 20% of other varieties. For us, the 20% usually is uh, Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay. okay, so you get 80%, 20%, you put them together and you get, well, then you need to put the passion, the love, right. and all the, the, <laughs> the beautiful barrels, the weather, the soil, <laughs> yes. and you get the Chianti Classico. Yes. Extremely sweet. It's delicious. And think that uh, from this uh, good fruit, you have this beautiful wine. You got a bucket there? Yeah. Do we need to fill the whole bucket? Uh, if you want. This is gonna be, number one is gonna kill my back. Okay. I'm a 40 years old man, I'm not a young <laughs> chicken anymore. See, if I would do this, I will uh, just sing. Okay. I'm not gonna sing, I'm just saying, if I was by myself and nobody can hear me, I would probably okay. sing. Okay, <laughs> okay. No now. I think no, no now. Uh, you're working very good. I know, but your back, my back is killing me already. <laughs> I think that we do this nine hours every day. Why every don't day. you pick and I hold the bucket? Yeah. They may do this for nine hours a day, but with an aching back, I convinced Massi to show me the next step in this process. So when it's full with nine pounds of grapes, we put up the temperature around 27 Celsius. Is it the right temperature to start the fermentation? We add the yeast and all the sugar become alcohol. When the wine is ready, how many days? 15 days maximum. So in 15 days, you can actually, grape becomes wine. Almost. Well, you know. Because you need after to age the wine. Yeah, how do you age the wine? What's up? We need to make another kind of fermentation that is called the malolactic, so that reduces the, uh, the acidity of the wine. And we fill the barrels. The barrels. Exactly, it's a French oak. Yeah. And we start to age the wine. French oak. 
French oak. We use the French oak. Why yes, French oak? Why French... not Italian oak? Because, <laughs> because the French oak is better. I'm sorry don't to tell you. Don't say that. I don't <laughs> want to hear anything French is better. Look, I need to taste some wine. Of course, so you're have you welcome. Got a, have you yeah. got a place where we can have I think five it... or six, seven? Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen bottles of wine. Of course, we have huh? a special place for you. Special place, yes. Come on, take me. I'm okay, all yours. No. Follow me. I'm all yours. <laughs> and it's a very special place. Massi has given me an exclusive seat in the Baron's Castle, where I'll be sampling two of the vineyard's Chianti Classico wines and a Merlot that also produced right here. Massi, first of all, thank you very much for allowing me to, uh, to come and visit this room. Yeah, it's I beautiful. Mean, huh? It's amazing, and I feel very honored. <laughs> You're lucky. You're so, lucky. I'm lucky, I'm <laughs> lucky. Okay, wine tasting. Yes, we started with the Colle di La, is okay. a, our Chianti Classico crew. Okay. Means that this is the wine that comes from the vineyards where you pick the grapes today. Oh, nice. So uh, it's a single uh, vineyard, 100% Sangiovese. Okay. That we pick by hand, like you did. Yeah. And we... Are you ever going to pour the wine, or we just yeah. going to talk about the wine? I was talking about. I, you know, <coughs> I, I can thirsty? smell okay. wine. <laughs> I picked the grape for you. When are we going to taste? What's the technique? The first, we look at the color. It's not very, very deep. No, but red. it's got a good purpley red. Purpley red, right. Okay. And this is the characteristic of the color of a Sangiovese okay. wine. Okay. And after you turn the wine okay. in the glass. I saw that done in the movie. Okay. So then we smell. You smell. And arrive oh, all the clean. Aroma. Yes, clean, but also very rich. Can I go? Yeah, of course. You're making funny noises. Yes, we have to do this because you need to breathe um, air together with the wine. Oh, so it's the same thing when I taste uh, extra virgin olive oil. Exactly. Ah, you do the... Yeah, so you spray the, the, the wine in the mouth and the, you, you give oxygen and you can express better the, the quality of the wine. Mm. Is uh, the maximum of the quality of a Chianti Classico uh, denomination. Buono. Oh, so man, it's strong, eh? It's a, it's a wine wow, that's very, very rich. good. The second wine Massi gives me to try is another Chianti Classico. But instead of being pure Sangiovese grape, it's mixed with Cabernet Sauvignon and Petit Verdot grapes. This oh. one, the same. If you look at the color, you see that it's a little bit more darker. This is definitely darker eh, compared to the uh, yes. first one. Oh, did we do Salute? We, didn't, we forgot to do no, Salute. No, we didn't before. Salute, Salute, Salute. <laughs> no. Mm. You feel in the mouth it's very, very velvet. It's very smooth. Smoother than the, uh, yes. um, the first, really nice. I can see that there is more going on here mm -hmm. than there is here. You have different grapes, so three grapes inside this wine and gives nice. it maybe more, yeah, more okay. complexity to the wine. The last one is actually a Merlot, so does not need to conform to any of the strict Chianti making rules of production. Is it me or is it even darker than the one of before? Of course, Merlot is darker. Wow. Merlot gives a lot so of So it's got lighter, dark, Dark. Really darker? Yes. Okay. We're gonna get drunk after this. Yes. Fruit, very red. This and is strong. And it's stronger. You must have a favorite as well. Of course I have. Can I pick my one and you need to be honest if okay. the... Too strong for me. I think I'm gonna go for this. I knew it. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, I agree. There is more going on in this one than the first one. Third one, too strong. And the other thing that I like about this one is I can see that it's very versatile. I can match this one with a steak. I can match this one with a, uh, a beautiful ragu and pasta. I can pretty much match this wine with anything. Buono. Molto buono. Questo è buono. Thank you for the experience that you gave me. Salute. Salute. And uh, I've learned a lot. And you know that the Italy needs more people like you with passion Thank and that they produce good things. <laughs> Thank you. Salute to you and Chianti Classico. Salute. Salute. The region's cuisine is defined by hearty food and is especially famous for his wild game, which goes particularly well with that glass of Chianti. So I'm going to show you how to prepare a wild boar ragù. 
First, start with some extra virgin olive oil in a hot, heavy baste pan. Are you hearing that? The reason why you want to brown the meat, you want to make sure that it's all sealed outside, but all the juices stays inside for later. Look at that. If you can get wild boar, pork shoulder will work beautifully. Set the wild boar aside to rest. So, in the same pot, we are now going to cook the sofrito. Sofrito is made up of finely chopped onions, celery and carrots and forms the base of any Italian ragu. It's going to release the sweetness and the flavour to make your very plain tomato sauce into a fantastic tomato sauce. After a couple of minutes, add some pancetta and fry with the sofrito for 8 to 10 minutes. Time to introduce the wine. You put the wine in there, let the wine bubble away. As the wine is bubbling away, what's happening? The alcohol goes away, but the flavor of the wine stays in. And we want to reduce this one by half. While it's reducing, let's talk about the tomatoes. The tinned chopped tomatoes has got water in it, and it's gonna help the meat to tenderize. Tomato puree is gonna give a nice, sexy color to the sauce. And straight after, I got stock. I'm using beef stock, just to give a little bit of character to the sauce. You can use chicken or vegetable, whatever you want. And then add the meat straight in. Now look at the shine on the sauce already. Cover slightly with the lid and simmer gently for one hour on a low heat. It looks like delicious. Okay, nice and thick, shiny. And then I'm gonna use my final ingredients, fennel seeds. It's gonna give some kind of aniseed flavor with the wild boar that it goes really, really well. Let me tell you something, when you make a ragu, the secret here is be patient. Don't rush it, let it bubble away slowly, slowly. Every 10 minutes, stir it, look at it, appreciate the color and the smell, and that's how you make a traditional Italian ragu. Cover and let it rest for 15 minutes, which gives you the time to cook the pasta. The water has to be bubbling, bubbling like a jacuzzi bubbling. Blah, 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 blah. That's the way I want it. Then, salt. And the pasta I'm going to use for my wild boar ragu is rigatoni. To make sure the rigatoni is al dente, cook it for one minute less than the instructions on the packet. Okay, pasta is drained. Now, what you have to do, keep the heat underneath, the sauce and the pasta, they need to get together before you serve them to your guests. Finally, finish with some parmesan and serve. Ho -ho. And there you have it, my rigatoni with wild boar ragu. One word, fantastico! And with my belly full of authentic Tuscan cuisine, I'm ready for my next adventure. I'm exploring the popular region of Tuscany and uncovering its less well-known site. The walled city of Siena, home to the world famous Palio, may be one of Tuscany's most visited destinations. But a few miles outside of this city is somewhere that shares the same structure as this walled city, on a much, much smaller scale. The tiny medieval hamlet of Bertine may be small in size, but it's truly enchanting. Originally a fortress built prior to the 11th century, it's a fantastic example of living history. Over time, it's become a small village with 31 locals, and that's what I'm finding out about this region. It's full of hidden gems. Sweeping past this little town is another Tuscan tradition, and it means I need to swap these four wheels for two. This is Leroica, a vintage bike ride that celebrates the Tuscan white graveled roads, starting in the middle of Gaiole, past Bertine, and ending in the city of Siena. 
joining me on my two-wheeled adventure is expat Angela, a die-hard Leroyca fan. See, when they said to me, would you like to go to Tuscany? I was thinking, drinking wine, eating sausages, <laughs> maybe shooting a couple of wild boars. <laughs> Never thought in a million years I would have been on a vintage bike with you. I mean, you look at the part, I look like a woolly on a bike. I'm, I'm wearing vintage gear because it's all about celebrating yeah. old, old cycling, cycling from the days of Fausto Coppi, our famous Italian oh. cyclist. And that... See, I'm wearing Dolce Gabbana and uh, <laughs> Giorgio Armani. Very appropriate. Yeah, well. <laughs> Leroyca is a celebration as well of the white gravel roads that we're cycling on. They're not very comfortable. But uh, the idea was to preserve these roads because this is part of the cultural heritage of Tuscany. This is hidden Tuscany. You can get to see places, cycle through vineyards, uh, all kinds of things that you wouldn't see if driving on the ordinary roads. I'm all about hidden Tuscany. <laughs> Angela, is it me who I detect a bit of an Irish accent? You do indeed. <laughs> oh, to be sure. <laughs> I can do that. Everybody does that to me when they talk Italian and they pretend to do the Italian accent. So. Absolutely. I'm, I'm Irish, but I've been living in Italy for 20 years now. Okay. It was also 20 years ago that Leroyca started. Once a year now, the cyclists take on one of the three routes, varying in length, but all pedaling through the iconic Tuscan landscape. Here in Tuscany, to cycle up to 209 kilometers, because that's the longest distance that you can do. But you and me, we're just going to do the short route. Oh, uh, 46 please, kilometers. Please. At 46 kilometers, that's the short road. <laughs> that's I don't know. the short route. I'm going to be honest with you. I know we just met. I don't know if my testicles can take 46 <laughs> kilometers on this bike. Do you think we can get a gin and tonic around here? Hell no, Gino. Gin and tonic, no. Let's go to one of the many pit stops on the Eroica route and we can get some good Tuscan food some Chianti wine and some Ribolita. You lead, I'm coming. Okay, go on. let's go. Oh, is anyone behind me? <laughs> Don't go too fast! <laughs> My legs couldn't make it quite as far as the official pit stop, so we pulled up for an impromptu roadside picnic. I have to say, I am really looking forward to trying this. What kind of ingredients do you have in the Ribolita? All of the best that Tuscany has to offer. Okay. Beans, kale, or cabbage, kale, exactly, carrots. Yeah. So this gives the energy for these bikers to for do 200 cycle. and God knows how many miles they do, these people. Exactly. Okay. Mmm. <laughs> wow. And it's even nice cold. It is. Very nice. Lovely setting for a picnic, by the way. Salute. Chin chin. So I'm making my ribolita with a Gino twist. Where do we start is with the almighty Italian sausage. Fry your sausages in a pan with a little olive oil. Bursting with flavors. Nice. And once cooked through, set aside. Then it's on to the veg. We cook them in the same pot, so all the flavors and the fat from the sausage is gonna go straight into the vegetable. And we start with bay leaf, an onion, red onion, nice and sweet. Mwah. The sofrito is the base of this dish. So to the onions, I'm adding diced carrots and celery. Then we go potatoes, peel them, cut them into little cubes. Then add three cloves of chopped garlic and a pinch of chili flakes. Okay, all nice and mixed, get all the flavor going. What I want you to do now, cover with the lid, just leave a little bit of the lid open on one side. 10, 15 minutes, let them sweat it down, but do not color the vegetable. Meanwhile, what I want you to do, get yourself a pestle and mortar here, and I got fennel seeds. And the reason why you crush them, so you release as much flavor as possible. Then add some chopped and thin tomatoes. Then the next stage, I've got a little bit of vegetable stock. Make sure that the stock is hot, otherwise you're gonna cool everything down. Nice, look at those colors. Fantastic. Now cover it with the lid and bubble it up for half an hour. Beautiful. Then you add 300 grams of chopped kale and 400 grams of tinned cannellini beans. Let it bubble away for about four or five minutes and then the job is done. Meanwhile, what I want you to do 
sausages. By now they should be nice and cooled down. After five minutes, add the sliced sausage and two large handfuls of stale bread to the pot. Give it a good mix. Make sure that the bread goes on the bottom of the pan. Now this looks sexy. Beautiful. I love the color. Mmm. Ribollita Toscana. If I have to sum up my experience so far in Tuscany, it's all in here, in this dish. Simple, colorful, hearty. I don't have any other word. I'm going to carry on eating. This is magnificent. I've enjoyed uncovering a different side to Tuscany. So if you ever find yourself here, take the time to step off that beaten truck.